<laughs> Greetings, programmers. Um, so tonight's going to be a little different for me. Um, I'm going to be showing you some code. I usually don't like talks with a lot of code in them. I find them really boring and tedious, and this should be no exception. <laughs> but it, it's part of the story, and I think it, it's actually going to explain some stuff. So tonight I'm talking about monads. Monads is something that was popularized by the Haskell community and has started to infiltrate its way into uh, other language communities, including ours. And it's a really interesting thing and really powerful thing, but it seems impossible to understand because in addition to its being good and, and useful, it's also cursed. And the curse of the monad is that once you get the epiphany, once you understand, oh, that's what it is, you lose the ability to explain it to anybody else. <laughs> um, there is tons of evidence for this. Um, go to Yahoo and Google for Monad or <laughs> Monad Tutorial or Monad Burrito or Monad anything, and you'll find this stuff and someone will go, oh, okay, I understand it now. And you read what they write and it won't make any sense at all. So that's the, the curse of the Monad. So um, I'm going to try to break the curse tonight and explain monads in a way that you will finally be able to understand them and perhaps even communicate them to other people. Certainly you'll be able to look at that stuff that you Googled and, and understand what it was that they were trying to say, what they would have said had they not been cursed. So um, we're going to start with functional programming. And there are two senses of functional programming, and they're both interesting and relevant to this conversation. So the first one is simply programming with functions, right? And any language that has functions in it, it you're doing functional programming. So functions entered programming languages with Fortran 2 in 1958. Um, you declare a function with a declaration that says function with a name and parameters wrapped in, in parentheses, which might look kind of familiar to some of you. I mean, we're, we're still writing that. Um, Fortran was developed before lowercase was invented, so everything was in uppercase. <laughs> but other than that, um, it, it looks the same. Now, one of the stupid things in Fortran was you didn't have to declare your variables. So um, variables uh, were implicit. Um, but fortunately, they were scoped to the function. They weren't uh, implicit globals like JavaScript does, which is way stupider. Um, and if you want them to be global, then you would specify them in a common statement. Um, and you didn't have, to, didn't have to specify their types, even though it's a typed language. And the convention they had was, if the variable starts with i, j, k, l, m, or n, it's an integer. Uh, otherwise, it's floating point. Um, so the way you returned a value from a function, um, the function had a name, and you would assign to that name. And then when you hit the return statement, whatever value you last assigned to the name of the function, that was what was returned. And this was also before curly braces were invented, so um, the way you ended the function was by saying name. Um, and this was highly influential. All languages have some version of this, um, some with different syntax, some with different um, keywords, like there have been uh, func, uh, Procedure, proc, subroutine, lots of other things. But basically, everybody's doing the same thing, lambda. Um, but programming with functions becomes interesting when you have first class functions. Func that's where you can take a function and assign it to a variable or pass it to another function or return it from a function. That's interesting stuff. And when, when you have functions that are passing other functions around, that's called higher order functions, and that's great stuff. I'm going to be talking a lot about that tonight. And the thing that makes all this stuff work really well is lexical closure, which is the idea that um, an inner function has access to the variables of the function that it's nested inside of, so that functions scope the same way that blocks do. That turned out to be a brilliant invention. Uh, we got that with a scheme. Anybody know what the first mainstream language was that did that? It was JavaScript. JavaScript was the first language to take this brilliant thing and bring it to the mainstream. So um, that's one sense of functional programming. The other, sometimes called pure functional programming. 
The difference is, in pure functional programming, it's mathematical. You're thinking about functions as, ma as mathematical functions, which is very different than a, a subroutine that returns a value, which is what we uh, do in, in our other languages. So in, in a mathematical function, you could implement it as some computation, or you could implement it as a map, because any, or for every function, for any input, it's always going to give exactly the same output. Right? And whether you find that by computing it or looking it up, it should work exactly the same. So that's very different than the way functions in our languages work because all of our, lang all of our functions will have side effects. They'll do things besides return the, the same value that they would always return. So one of the ways of characterizing the difference between impure functions and pure functions is the difference between memoization and caching. So in a pure mathematical system, um, functions without side effects, you could take um, any of the values that the function returns and memoize them and avoid the cost of computation. So memoization is a simple optimization. We attempt to do the same thing with caching with uh, uh, mutable forms, but caching is like a deal with the devil, right? There, there are always problems with caching. It, it can create bottlenecks because everything has to go through the cache. Or in distributed systems, it creates inconsistency because we cache in order to avoid going across the network. But because we didn't go across the network, we don't know if the data is up to date or not. And so you get lots of confusion and difficulty there. If you were always doing stuff purely mathematically, there would never be that confusion. Because you could distribute it any number of ways, and every function always produces the same value for the same inputs, and everything's fine. Um, so um, the, the people who like pure mathematical programming, pure functional programming, think it's great because you don't have side effects. And that makes programs much easier to reason about. If you have a function that can do um, affect state or be affected by other state, then it's much harder to test because sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, even with the same inputs. In a pure functional system, that's never a problem. And so uh, Haskell is a language which is based on the pure functional model. And the advocates of that language say it is much better because there is a huge class of errors which simply cannot occur because you don't have side effects. Now, it turns out you can easily transform JavaScript into such a language by removing features. You don't have to add anything. The things you have to remove are the assignment statement. So you can keep the var statement. So you can set the values of vars in a var statement. But once they're set there, they cannot change again. You have to get rid of loops because things change in a loop, and we're not changing things anymore. You have to use recursive functions instead, which is actually a good thing. Um, you would have to freeze all array literals and object literals as soon as they're created. Once they're made, you can't modify them. Then you also have to remove things like date, because every time you call date, you get a different value. Well, that doesn't make sense mathematically, right? So you've got to get rid of that. And you have to get rid of the, the random function for the same reason. Um, and if you do all of those things, then you will have a true functional programming language that computes without mutation. And you get all the benefits that come from that. But there is a dark side to that. I mean, everything's a trade-off, right? And the trade-off here is it makes, think, makes it really difficult to do stuff in the real world. So in Haskell, if you're just doing computation, it's brilliant. But if you're trying to do a practical program, which is going to interact with people or with things in the world, it gets really hard because you can't mutate anything. Everything always has to be the same. You can't ever change anything. And so the Haskell people really struggled with how can we write practical programs in a world which is completely immutable when, in fact, the world is constantly changing. And so. Um, they struggled it with, with it for a while, and then they came up with monads. Monads gave them a loophole in the function contract. The function contract says that a function for any input has to produce exactly the same output and change no other state. The loophole is that a function can take another function as an argument. Okay? Well, every function closes over some state, right? Um, so every time you call something passing in a function, that's the first time it's ever seen that particular function over that closure, right? So it's always different. And it gives them a way to kind of 
uh, fiddle around with this stuff. So they um, used this trick to implement the IO monad. The IO monad is a solution to a problem you will never have. <laughs> because you, you, you like mutation, right? You're not in a pure functional system. You're in this practical function system. And so that's great. So you never have to do that. But it turns out there are other benefits to monads besides the IO monad. And so they're still interesting, even though we don't need that one. Um, now, the people who would try to teach you this stuff would say that in order to understand monads, you first have to learn Haskell. You have to learn Haskell. If you don't know Haskell, you can't make sense of monads. And they'd say, and while you're at it, you should probably learn category theory, too. I think this is like saying, in order to understand burritos, you must first <laughs> learn Spanish. <laughs> it turns out it's not true, is it? Um, you know, I could say, okay, everybody, we're going to learn about burritos today, so repeat after me, donde esta la biblioteca? <laughs> and ultimately, that gives you nowhere with relation to burritos. That you can, without knowing any Spanish, you can order a burrito, you can eat it, you can enjoy it, you can learn to make your own burritos, you can invent new kinds of burritos, and you can do all of those things without learning Spanish. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't learn Spanish. There are lots of really good reasons to learn Spanish. If you learn Spanish, you can learn much more about Mexican cuisine. You can make stuff that's more authentic. You can uh, in, uh, create fusions that are amazing. You can interact with wonderful people who you would never interact with otherwise. If you're one of the job creators, it gives you a chance to talk directly with the people who are doing your work for you. That's pretty good. And the same is true for Haskell. I, I would never tell anybody, don't learn Haskell. I'd say, you should learn it, because it's actually an amazing language, and it can teach you a lot of things. You just don't need to learn Haskell in order to understand monads. Now, uh, there, there are Haskellites who will say, that's not true. You don't dare try to learn monads without mastering Haskell first. But I say, my friends, if you have the chicharrones, you can. And we're going to do that tonight. <laughs> so they would also say, first you start with the type theory. You've got to understand the type theory. Otherwise, you'll never go anywhere. And it's just too dangerous to do this stuff without understanding it. It's actually the case that if you ignore the type theory, it's actually easier. And if you do this stuff in a language which does not enforce uh, type constraints, this stuff actually gets easier. And they say, no, that's not true. You cannot do this stuff without the types. But if you have the huevos, my friends, you can. So let's uh, sack up and look at some monads. What do you say? <laughs> it turns out the ideal language for doing this stuff is JavaScript. Um, so here we go. Let's look at uh, our first code. So this is a, a tale of three functions, the unit function, the bind function, and another function that is the argument of the bind function. All three of these functions return monads. And that's it. That's the whole thing. So, um, okay, so what, except I didn't tell you what a monad is. A monad is an object. Um, okay, so, <laughs> so you look at the unit function. Okay, the unit function takes a value, returns an object. You might be thinking, well, that sounds like a constructor. And I say, yes, my friend, you're using your cojones. That is a constructor. That's all it is. So the magic must be somewhere else, right? It must be in the bind function. The bind function takes a monad and takes a function that takes a value like the value that was passed into the unit function, and it also returns a monad. And that's it. That's it. That's, that's monads. So you're asking, that can't be it. Of course, no, that's not it, because they're also axioms. Okay, so there are the three axioms of monads. So if you're doing something and you think it's a monad, then it must satisfy these three axioms. The first two describe the relationship between the bind function and the unit function, and the third one talks about composition. Um, and so it's obvious, right, how useful this is. So, um, but, it, but it could be better. So um, 
the, the way bind as a function is actually problematic because you might have lots of different kinds of monads and each one would have to have its own bind function. And, and this is not the bind function that's in uh, JavaScript's uh, uh, function prototype. This is a different bind function, but it doesn't interfere with that one. But we don't want to have to be managing multiple global bind functions and having to come up with naming conventions to keep them com from conflicting. It turns out object-oriented programming teaches us how to deal with this stuff, right? We want to change this global function into a method on the monad itself. And in doing that, a lot of stuff gets cleaned up. And this is a trivial uh, transformation for us, right? All of us you know, can very easily convert a function from its function form into a method form, right, by binding things to this and putting it on a prototype. So let's do that. Um, so um, we're going to start looking at the code now. This is where it's going to start getting boring and tedious. Um, I'm going to start with uh, a note about the colors here. So you've all heard about uh, syntax coloring, everybody. It's, it's something that's in editors and IDEs to make it easier for kindergartners to do programming. And, and what it does is it, it gives some of the features of the language bright, happy colors so that you can more easily distinguish them. You know, so numbers are one color and, and strings are another and variables and so on. Everything's a different color. And, you know, if, and if, for some people that seems to make a lot of difference. But I find it, it doesn't do much for me because I'm, I'm sort of more of a grown-up. And <laughs> what I do want is context coloring, because I'm working a lot in these function systems, right, where I've got lots of nested functions. And sometimes it's possible to get lost in all the nesting of these functions. And so what I want is to have a coloring scheme which makes it clear to me what's going on. So global stuff is white. Functions that are declared at the top level are green. Functions declared inside of the green ones are yellow, inside the, the yellow ones are blue, except the variables always have the color of where they were declared. And that makes it really easy to see how the closure is working, where something was created, lets me see how long it's going to live, and so on. And that turns out to be really, really important. So I wish someone would build an editor for me that does this kind of coloring, because I need this. I, th I think you all need this. Uh, now, in some languages, when you're implementing monads, you would recognize that there are lots of different kinds of monads, and they all have basically the same properties. And so you'd like to have a macro that you could use to define all the monads you're going to make. Um, for example, Common Lisp has a really nice macro system in it, and you would write a monad macro and then create lots of specific macro or monads using that. Now, JavaScript, unfortunately, does not have macros. But it does have functions, and it does have dynamic objects. And so by using those creatively, you have macroids, things that are like macros but are just ordinary functions that end up doing useful things to help us to construct our objects. So this is the monad macroid, which I'm going to use over the next hour or so to make several different kinds of monads. So let's look at what it does. So it returns a unit function. In, in uh, Haskell, they call the unit function return, which is really complicated. So we're not going to call it that. We're going to call it unit. Um, and it will create a monad, which will inherit nothing, because it's made with object.create null. And it will put a bind method in that monad. And that bind method will take a function as an argument and return the value of calling that function with the value that was passed into the unit constructor. And then it returns the monad, and that's it. OK, so let's look at how we would use this. Um, this is, um, in this form, it's called the identity monad. Um, the, the value that got passed into the unit will be the thing that gets passed into all the bind functions. So we'll create our identity constructor by calling monad, and we'll create our monad by calling the identity constructor passing in hello world. And then I can call monad.bind passing the alert function. And it will call alert. And it'll say hello world. Eke mono, behold the monad. 
That's it. That, that is it. Um, <laughs> like, except they're, they're still the axioms, okay? So here are the axioms. They've been rewritten now in the object-oriented form, in the method form. I think they're, they're actually easier to understand in this form. But what's really interesting is the third axiom, which is the one about composition. Um, it lets us write monad.bind of f dot bind of g. You compare that to the functional form where the thing is written inside out, right? And so it's much harder to look at that and, and look at the first one and see how does that make it easier to do composition. The second one, the composition is really easy because it reads strictly left to right. And, and you can imagine, you know, I also want to bind H and J and K and everybody else, and, and it's a very nice composition form. Now, some of you might be looking at and, and be thinking, this looks really familiar. Um, I got a, a monad, which is an object, dot something that looks like a method, dot something that looks like a method. You know, where have I seen this before? Is this, yeah, everybody knows, right? This is the Ajax monad. We've been doing this for years. We've been doing it from the beginning. We've always been doing monads. Um, we're all doing stuff in Ajax libraries. We're using YUI or other things. And they all work this way. Um, so um, so um, I, I first wrote an Ajax library in this form in 2001. I wrote my first Ajax library in 2000. It was mainly to manage the huge painful differences between Netscape 4 and IE5. It was horrendous, and I was trying to write some kind of layer that would allow you to, to write to both of them at the same time, which was really, really hard. Um, I then wrote a second generation by observing what kind of stuff we were doing with the first one and trying to factor out a lot of the tedious, repetitive work. And th this was my third one. In this one, I got the idea that if I just wrap the um, DOM node in my own object and invest that object with lots of useful methods. And if each of those methods returns itself, then I can just string all this stuff together and it becomes a much, much more pleasant way to write stuff. And everybody in JavaScript does this. Um, it, this is the common pattern. Um, in 2007, I applied this idea to security. So I developed the AdSafe system. And now I want not just to wrap the DOM nodes in an object, I want that to be a secure object so that there's no, so I can give that object to a third party who I don't fully trust and be confident that they can only do with that object what I intended for them to do, that they cannot get directly to the DOM and then to the network and to the world. And it worked, you know, and it's basically a monad system. Um, so the thing that uh, we, we need to do is to make the um, representation more expressive. So we don't want to have to be writing dot bind a func, we want to be writing dot method instead because that's a much friendlier way of writing stuff. That makes it recognizably Ajaxy. Um, so I want to add uh, the facility of, of having parameters that get uh, passed into the method and I want, and I'll do that by having a second argument to the bind method which can optionally take an array of parameters. Um, so let's um, make some modifications to our macroid. Um, I'm creating a prototype for each unit function that I generate. And that's going to be the holder of the methods that each of these monads is going to inherit. And when I create the monad, I will have it inherit from that prototype. Then I want to modify the bind function to take um, a second argument which can contain a bunch of, an array of arguments. And unfortunately, because of this horrible design stupidity in JavaScript, it's hard and stupid looking and complicated and error prone. Fortunately though, in the next edition, we're probably gonna have a feature called splat, which replaces those three lines with this one. So essentially, I say dot dot args and it works. This is going to be my second favorite feature in ES6. So I'm, hoping we get that out on time, because I really, really want this. Um, then I want to be able to add things to the prototype. So I can add to uh, unit a method which will take a name and a function and stick that function with that name into the prototype. 
and it will even return itself. So we've got a monadic pattern going on with it as well. So I can say dot method, dot method, dot method, and keep adding stuff to my monad. But I can make it even better. So um, I can have a method called lift, which does the same thing as the method, except it will take any function, not just a function that knows about monads, um, and it will um, uh, call bind passing in that function and then take that function's result and pass it to unit to guarantee that the result will be a monad. So I can take any existing function and have it work in my monad without having to rewrite it. That's pretty cool. So let me show you an example of that. So um, I'm going to call uh, the macroid now to create my Ajax constructor. And I will call its lift method to add an alert method, which happens to do what alert does. Um, and then I will make my monad. And then I can call monad.alert, and it will alert hello world. OK? So that's the Ajax monad. Um, but there's more. OK, so um, we've got the problem with null, right? Um, Null was designed badly in Java, and JavaScript got it wrong in the same way. Sometimes it seems like Java was optimized for creating null pointer exceptions. <laughs> so when you get a null pointer exception, what that usually means is you forgot to say, if thing is null, don't do that, right? Um, you just want to not do that if the thing is null. So it's not actually doing anything useful for you. It's just creating work for you. It's something you have to go out of your way to keep it from blowing itself up. So that's a bad thing. Turns out monads give us a way to, to deal with that. Um, and it's called the maybe nomad, monad. Um, and it's modeled after the way NAN works. So it used to be in the early programming languages, if you divide something by zero, boom, your program dies. That's because mathematically, division by zero is undefined, and the CPU doesn't know what to do, so it halts. And so that, that was bad. It meant that every time you did a division, you'd first have to say, if divisor is 0, don't do that. Um, eventually, someone figured out that, well, if we have a, a, a value that represents what would happen if you divide by, by 0, and just pass that around again and not halt, but just pass around this value, and it's toxic, but at the end, you can ask, oh, yeah, it's, it's NAN, so nothing happened. But at least your program gets to keep going. And usually, that's the right thing to do. Could we have null work the same way? And it turns out, yes, we can. And that's what the maybe monad is. So I'm going to make one more modification to my macroid. I'm going to pass in an optional modifier function. And I will call that function as the last step of creating each monad. OK? So here's how we can use that. Um, I'm going to define maybe as being the monad, that, monad constructor that's created by passing in this function, which asks, is the value null or undefined? And if it is, I'm going to turn this into a null monad um, by changing its bind function from something that will um, call the function that gets passed in with the value. Instead, it simply returns the monad, effectively doing nothing. So now, um, I'll make my monad by calling uh, maybe of null. And I'll call monad.bind of alert. And nothing happens. No error. It just it never called alert because it was a null monad. Nothing happens. So you can imagine having an application which is guaranteed to never ever throw null pointer exceptions. And there's only one null check in the entire system, and it's right here. And it only becomes effective when you pass in null to the monad constructor. That's pretty cool, right? It's, it's free. It's wonderful. It's amazing. Um, so our friend, the monad. Uh, we've seen three monads now, the identity monad, which is kind of useless, but it's the first one you have to do in order to understand it. You certainly don't want to start with the IO monad, because it just won't make any sense. Then the Ajax monad and the maybe monad. Um, so, uh, so that's all I got about monads, and there's still a lot of time. So I'm going to talk about concurrency. 
so concurrency is trying to make lots of things happen at the same time. And concurrency turns out to be really hard. In Java and other languages, most other languages, uh, threads are the tool for dealing with concurrency. And threads are evil. Um, they, they don't scale well. They're really hard to use. They race. They deadlock. They're, they're bad things. Now, there are, are alternatives to threads. One of them is pure functional programming. Because it turns out if, um, if your functions are purely uh, are, are pure, and if there are no side effects, then you can distribute stuff all over the place, have everything going on simultaneously, nothing ever conflicts, right? Because all computations are independent and, and everything's good. The only problem is if you have to deal with the real world, it gets hard. Even with the IO monad, this stuff's really hard, um, especially if you have to talk to databases and stuff like that. So a, a more practical solution is turn-based programming where you um, are single-threaded and race-free and deadlock-free, which are great, but the trade-off is you have to obey the law of turns, which says never wait, never block, and finish fast. Now, it turns out this is easy to live with. This is um, how we do stuff in, in web browsers, you know, how you do stuff in event-driven systems or message-passing systems. You don't need threads. You don't need mutual exclusion. You just do things in turns, and it all works out. So most UI frameworks um, are turn-based. There are now servers that are turn-based. Uh, there's Elko for Java. There's Twisted for Python. Of course, Node.js for JavaScript. Um, now, some people complain that asynchronicity can be hard to manage. Um, for example, if you have um, a number of requests to make which are dependent sequentially on each other, um, the naive way to write that would be to have nested event handlers or or message handlers, and th that's really brittle and, and hard to maintain and bad. So you, you want to be able to compose that stuff better. And there's a better way to do it called promises. Um, promises are an excellent mechanism for managing asynchronicity. Uh, a promise is a value that represents a possible future value. Uh, promises were inspired by futures, which fell out of the actor model. Um, that turns out they can work really well in JavaScript. Uh, every promise has a corresponding resolver that is used to ultimately assign a value to the promise. And a promise at any moment can have one of three states. It can be kept, broken, or pending. Uh, a promise is an event generator. So you can register events with a promise, and it fires its event when the value of the promise is ultimately known. And at any time after the making of the promise, uh, event handling functions can be registered with a promise which will be called in order with the promise's value when it's known. OK, so oh, one more. Um, a promise can accept functions that will be called when the va with the value once the promise has been kept or broken. Um, and you register things with the promise with the when function. When the result of the promise is known, um, then either call my success function or call my failure function. And the when function itself returns a promise based on the result of the success function. Um, and that allows us to compose things in an interesting way. So I make a promise by uh, calling my uh, wow dot vow dot make. So I want to make a vow. It will return a vow object, which contains a keep method, which will be called when we know what the value is, which keeps the promise, with a break method, which will be called when we know that the promise cannot be kept. Um, and then the promise itself, which is an object which I could break off and hand to you and say, here's my promise, and it will be good sometime in the future, probably, if I can keep it. Then you can take that promise object, and you can call its when method, um, passing it a function to be called when the promise is kept, and a function to be called if the promise is broken. So. Um, my idea of a, of a perfect file system would be something where I could um, ask to do something like read a file and have it return a promise. Because I don't want to block on, on I.O. ever. I don't want to block on anything. I want to get a promise back so nothing ever has to block. And when I get the promise back from uh, read file, I'll say when uh, the file is read, then call my success function and pass me the um, handle of, of the contents of the file, and, and it's good. And if it failed for some reason, then call my failure function instead. Now, you might be wondering, 
why do I have to send in a separate failure function? Why can't I just have an exception thrown at this point? And it's because of the time travelness of, of turns. So if you think about what an exception handler does, is it unwinds the stack, right? It gets us back up to some point. Well, in a turn-based system, at the end of every turn, the stack goes to zero. It's done. So there's no way that you can throw something into another turn. There's not, it's not there. You can't go back in time. You can only go forward in time. So you need a mechanism that can anticipate stuff happening. And that turns out to be promises. So that's why there are two aspects to the promise, the positive one and the negative one. The negative one is the thing that allows us to throw exceptions into the future. Um, so uh, exceptions modify the flow of control by unwinding the state. And in a turn-based system, the stack is empty at the end of each turn. Um, and exceptions can't be delivered across turns, but broken promises can. So we can cascade these things. Um, I can have a promise, and I can say, when that happens, call my function, and it will produce a value. And when it does that, then call B and, and have it do its thing, and it will return a promise. Um, and then I can call C. And if any of those fail, then the failure will hand, get handled. It, it will collect all the possible errors for all of those. Um, and each of these things is happening in a different turn, but it's okay. It, it will all prop, failures will propagate to that one failure. So that sort of gives us a way of doing a catch around stuff that's happening in different turns. And that turns out to be really useful. Um, so the, the thing that's interesting about um, promises is the way they can compose. That I can um, put whens together, and that's equivalent of having uh, a when with an argument of a nested when. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, this looks familiar. I've seen something like this before. And great balls of fire, you're right. Uh, this is the third axiom. Because um, it turns out that promises are monads. Now, they're different, very different kinds of monads, but I think they are monads. Um, the, the differences are that um, the value is not known when the monad is made, as they were in the other monads that we looked at. Um, and each promise is linked to two resolver functions, uh, keep and break. We didn't have resolvers in uh, the other monads. And when is the bind method of promises, and when takes two functions, not one function. But otherwise, yeah, this is a monad. So um, OK, we're going to get tedious again. So I'm going to implement it. It's going to be about a page of JavaScript. And you can't put a page of, of text on the screen, so we're going to have to look at it in pieces. So we're going to start um, by making um, uh, the wow uh, object. And I'm using um, an immediately invoked function expression in order to do that, um, which is one of the good parts of JavaScript. But there is the syntactic uh, problem where I've got these parentheses that are being used to invoke it, and they're just hanging out there like a pair of dog balls. <laughs> Which is, you know, ladies may want to look away. Um, you know, it's, it's just nasty. So uh, what we want to do is wrap them inside of the parents. So the, the parents wrapping the whole invocation function tell the reader, this whole thing is important and should be read as a unit. We don't want the, this extra stuff dangling there. Um, OK. so. Um, OK, so this function is going to return an object containing a make method. So let's zoom in on make and see what it does. So make will have a couple of arrays in which it will keep uh, the functions that will be called when the, uh, when the promise uh, has been kept or broken. It has a variable to contain its ultimate fate, the, the va final value of the promise, and its current status, which initially has to be pending. Um, then uh, we're going to call a herald function. Let's, let's zoom in on that. Um, the herald function will take um, a, a new state, uh, the, the final value, and a queue of functions that need to be called uh, because the, the promise has been resolved. If it turns out the promise has already been resolved, then we're going to throw, because a promise can only be resolved once. Um, then we'll update the fate. We'll update the status will enlighten the queue. That 
tells the queue to tell everybody who's waiting uh, what it turned out to be. And then we'll empty out the, the two queues because we don't uh, need those functions anymore. Um, okay, then the object that we returned contains a break method and a keep method. The break method um, calls the herald to say, you know, we're broken, you know, tell the, uh, the guys who are waiting for the, the breakage uh, that it happened, and keep does the same thing except it's for the success functions. And then we return also the uh, promise object. So let's zoom in on the promise object. Uh, the promise object um, uh, is a promise, so it's got an informational field just to identify itself, and it has a when method. The when method takes two functions, kept and broken. Um, it creates a vow, it makes a vow. It will do something based on what the current status is, and it will return that promise. And uh, so what it does depends on the current status. If it's pending, it will take the two functions that were passed in, and it will put them on those two queues. Um, if the promise has already been kept, then it will just uh, put the kept function on its queue and enlighten that queue. And if the promise has already been broken, then it will put the breaker on the queue and enlighten the breakers. So the nice thing about that is that um, we don't have a race within the promise itself. There's not a race between when and the resolution of the promise. Um, you can register when before the promise is resolved. You can register when after. You cannot tell the difference. So that turns out to be a good thing. Um, then uh, this is in queue function. It, it um, puts the thing on the queue and returns a, uh, a promise and it resolves everything nicely. Um, and then there's the enlightened function, which will go through um, the queue. And for each function that's waiting for the result, it will call set immediate to cause that function to get called in a later turn. Uh, we don't want to resolve these things in the same turn because um, you know, they could throw exceptions, or they could eat up all the time, or do other bad things. And we don't want them to interfere with the other uh, functions that might want to be called. Set immediate is a new feature in uh, some browsers. It's not everywhere yet. Um, it does what um, uh, set timeout of zero should have done. Um, so you can use set timeout of zero here. It'll just be slower. Uh, it's when the web gets so stupid sometimes. But uh, so we have a new function to do what the other one should have done, except people were stupid, so it's got that. So anyway, the, the, the code is available on GitHub, so you can go and get the code and, and play with it. There's more to it than that, but not much more. Um, and there, there it all is, if someone wanted to write it down. It's the, the complete function. <laughs> yeah, oh man, that is so tedious and boring, but there it is. Okay, so our friend the monad. So uh, to recap, we saw the identity monad, the Ajax monad, the promise monad. Uh, did I say maybe? Maybe. Um, so anyway, lots of great monads. Um, and it's not that hard. You know, it, it, it's really just stuff that returns stuff like itself, and that, that's it. So it's kind of amazing that uh, all these guys have been running around saying monad and mixed company like it was some big deal, and it's it's really pretty simple. It's something we've always done. We, we just didn't know. Um, so um, until next time, don't forget your semicolons. Uh, thank you and good night. <laughs>
Mark has done some amazing things with promises. He's figured out a way to, to create wholly new uh, financial systems based on promises. Um, and uh, this is a couple of lectures that are on YouTube in which he lays this stuff out. Really interesting stuff, highly recommended. Okay, so do we have a question? Hi. Um, so I was thinking when you were talking about promises, is that something that you would want to see in ES5 like, or in like Node Core, or is that something for a user land to solve? That's a really good question. Um, the community hasn't figured out what all the pieces should be called yet. Uh, there's a lot of confusion about that, so I don't think it's ready for standardization. When it is ready, I don't think it belongs in JavaScript. Um, I think it very definitely belongs in an AJAX library or in uh, a server API or something like that. Um, I, I don't think it wants to be in the language. Now, that, that could change if in the future, um, if JavaScript were to have a messaging API which allows communicating with other JavaScript bats and instances out in the cloud and have distributed promises going through that environment, in that case, yeah, I think it would make sense. But in its current form as just something for managing asyn asynchronicity within a single VAT, um, I don't think it should be in the language. Now, there's a lot of interest in putting it into the language because getting W3C to do the right thing is really hard. Um, you know, so there's some people who think, well, maybe ECMO will be more receptive, so we'll put it in wherever we can get it. Um, a lot of the cruft in the world comes from fixing things in the wrong place. You know, we fix it where we can rather than where we should, and I, I think this would be one of those. Really? Yeah. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What? For the video. Thanks. Does this technique have any adverse effects on memory management? Oh, yeah. But, <laughs> but ultimately, it doesn't matter. I mean, um, God, we've got so much memory now. You know, I, I, when, I started, when, I, when I started programming, um, <laughs> no, literally, 64K was a lot of memory when I started programming. Um, and you know, I, I've got, I don't know how many gigabytes of, I've got 16 gigabytes of, of RAM on, on my laptop. I, it's, it's just in incomprehensible how much RAM we got. Um, you know, and so trying to save memory in JavaScript is like, I, I can't imagine a bigger waste of time. Um, <laughs> you, you, know, you know, like we've got, um, you know, it, it, it is possible to, to, to waste memory. Like you might have four dimensional arrays, it, you know, they'll very quickly consume all the memory in the world, right? So you don't want to get stupid, but just in terms of, all the linear sorts of things you can do, it's in the noise. It, it's hard to even observe that kind of usage. Uh, for example, um, I really like building objects out of closures. Um, and the cost is that you have to pay for a function object for each method of each object that you make. Whereas if you inherit from the prototype, you only have to pay that once per prototype. right? Um, and if you're making one object, it, it's the same. And if you're making less than a million objects, it really doesn't matter. I mean, you look at the amount of memory, you know, getting up to a megabyte, it's like, who cares? Um, so uh, most arguments about what wastes memory are not worth it. The thing you ought to be optimizing is your time. You know, what makes you most productive? Because you are the bottleneck, right? Um, memory is cheap, particularly when we distribute it over all the computers in the world, which is basically what we do now, um, you can't observe it. And so um, making us more productive, that, that turns out to be the big win. Cool. Thanks. Hey. Um, the Monad uh Pattern looks more or less like a builder pattern. I'm sorry, like a what pattern? A builder pattern. A builder. 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 Yeah. It looks like a builder pattern. So 
can I uh, more or less equate it to a builder pattern? Would it be wrong if I say so? Uh, does your builder pattern observe the three axioms? Uh, I mean, it returns itself, and you know, you can call methods on top of it, and you know, it continues to return itself and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, so that's, that's a good question. So in the Ajax monad, I showed how you can build something that looks exactly like an Ajax object out of a monad, right? So that the user of such an object cannot tell if it's a monad or not, right? So at, at that point, it becomes, well, then if something looks exactly like that, is it a monad? Um, and there's some people say, well, no, uh, and because you don't know Haskell. And <laughs> but I'm thinking, well, maybe, yeah. I mean, basically anything that returns this is kind of a monad. Um, I don't have a problem with that. Uh, hi. Uh, since it seems uh, here we implement the act mode in the JavaScript, do you see or predict uh, the potential of the JavaScript in the future? Maybe you have the same implement like uh, Scala or Erlen to do the highly scalable com com computation task? Oh, yeah. I, I think JavaScript is on track to becoming the fastest programming language in the world. Uh, there is a feature being considered for ES7 that came from uh, research done at Intel, in which you can take an, a, a special array of values and take an ordinary JavaScript function and apply that function to every element of the array, and it will distribute that work over all the available cores and do it in a highly parallel fashion. There is no other language today that can do that. Um, so, yeah, it, you know, in the next generation, if, if ECMA continues at its current rate, JavaScript will be the most powerful language in the world. So it seems here, consider which hours uh, uh, same code base ring on client as well as server, so maybe can distribute the calculation to the client so you can easily have the huge scale system. Uh, possibly, but then you're, you're dominated by network times, which tend to be vastly bigger than computation. So it's not clear that's a win necessarily. Thank you, thank you. Hi. So I couldn't tell by looking at your slides what would be the case if a promise lagged for a very long time and it was stuck in pending? Um, there is no guarantee that a promise will ever be resolved. Um, you know, the, the uh, easy proof is you pull the plug before any of the resolvers get to run. Mm -hmm. So that can happen. You can reach the end of the world without ever resolving the promise. So <laughs> it's not guaranteed to fire. But what you can do is have other promises which will uh, be resolved by a clock, right? Right, and then you can have, um, you can create uh, an algebra of combinations of things, and so you can have a clock acting as a dead, as a watchdog timer or or something, which will cause other things to fail if something's not resolved by a certain time. Now, you could consider um, designing promises that have the the clock built in, um, and that's certainly a an interesting way to factor it, but this one was going for simplicity, so it didn't. What's on your shirt, and is that a new book that you're writing? Uh, no. Um, so th th this shirt was designed for me by uh, Brent Ashley, who happens to be a Canadian. Um, <laughs> I guess that's, that's yeah. A, yeah. Any other questions for Douglas? Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you.